Hello, Namaste. I'm Ruchira Gupta, your host for the podcast A Free Voice. I'm an Emmy-winning journalist who went on to start Apnea, an NGO which works against sex trafficking. I have dedicated my life to amplifying voices of the most marginalized people in the world. I'm also the debut author of scholastic book I Kick and I Fly. In this podcast, I will talk to survivors, activists and storytellers who use their voice to make a difference in the lives of young people. How does an idea turn into action? How do you change a tragedy into recognizing your own powers? Together, we will examine and reimagine the world we want. I'm going to set it up a little bit. This is from the middle of If I Stay, and it's where our heroine Mia, in the flashback scene, because she's in pretty dire straits in a coma in the present tense scenes, is trying to ask her dad about what led him to sort of leave his life as a punk rock musician and become this kind of straight-laced middle school teacher. And they are playing checkers, and I start here. We played in silence. When it was dad's move, I'd steal looks at him in his button-down shirt, trying to remember the fast-fading picture of the guy with peroxided hair and a leather jacket. Dad? Hmm? Can I ask a question? Always. Are you sad that you aren't in a band anymore? Nope. Not even a little bit? Dad's gray eyes met mine. What brought all this on? I was talking to Gramps. Oh, I see. You do? Dad nodded. Gramps thinks that he somehow exerted pressure on me to change my life. Well, did he? I suppose in an indirect way he did, by being who he is, by showing me what a father is. But you were a good dad when you played in the band. The best dad. I wouldn't want you to give that up for me, I said, feeling suddenly choked up. And I don't think Teddy would either. Dad smiled and patted my hand. Mia, oh Maya, I'm not giving anything up. It's not an either-or proposition. Teaching or music, jeans or suits, music will always be part of my life. But you quit the band, gave up dressing punk. Dad sighed. It wasn't hard to do. I'd played that part of my life out. It was time. I didn't even think twice about it, in spite of what Gramps or Henry might think. Sometimes you make choices in life, and sometimes choices make you. Does that make sense? I thought about the cello, how sometimes I didn't understand why I'd been drawn to it, how some days it seemed as if the instrument had chosen me. I nodded, smiled, and returned my attention to the game. King me, I said. You just heard Gail Foreman read from her book, If I Stay. Gail is an old friend, a writer, an activist who works for democracy. And she also is empathetic with young people, travels all over the world from Ethiopia to India to Morocco, trying to find issues that she can reflect and communicate with younger people who are dealing with issues that no adult ever talks to them about. So here I am with Gail in my studio, and I remember the first time I met her was when I spoke to her about sex trafficking. And then she was in India, and we were having coffee together in the Yacht Club in Bombay, overlooking the Arabian Sea. And Gail had just come back uh, from uh, working in a Bollywood movie. (laughs) Do you remember, Gail? Of course I remember. That was a magical couple of weeks. And what was that like, like to come all the way from America, a girl from Brooklyn in a Bollywood movie set? That whole trip was so interesting because it was a year long trip that my husband and I had planned to go around the world. And three months before we were due to leave, 9-11 happened. And I remember we were like, should should we go? The world suddenly felt so much more dangerous. And we decided to go in part to remind ourselves that the way the world appears on a screen is so different from how it is in reality. And that entire year was kind of like reinforcement of that. It was it was such a reminder of the shared humanity that I've always believed in and always felt. So, you know, there was that. And then the Bollywood movie was just delightful and wonderful and a completely odd experience unlike anything I've ever experienced. So it was just really kind of fun to throw myself into kind of that side. I remember talking to your family and they were all so shocked and impressed. Like, really? You got you got stopped on the street to be in a Bollywood movie, which is how it happened. 
Uh, and I do remember that you were like, uh, you had to go and stay in a crummy hotel downtown, eat uh, food with the extras on set. And uh, you wrote up a whole article on globalization based on those experiences. My first book, actually, which is my only nonfiction book, was a book that kind of chronicled that year traveling around the world. And and it was all about um, sort of it was like a travel n- uh, memoir, but also it was about how there was kind of like a cultural globalization, which back in 2002 was was kind of new it was the, sort of the dawn of the Internet and how it was impacting all of these sort of far flung places and these sort of subcultures that had been kind of cropping up as a result. So in, in India, in particular, in Bollywood, so many of the films were, were set overseas because there's so many non-resident Indians and it makes it sort of seem chic and cosmopolitan, but they're all filmed in Mumbai. And so they needed white people to be in the background as extras. And there was a lot of the, um, the ashrams that a lot of people would come to and a lot of broke travelers. And so they were prime picking. So you would have these people who'd been living on the ashrams come and be extras in the Bollywood movie. So those sort of clash of cultures and also just looking at the the Bollywood film industry, which I didn't know anything about and, you know, dwarfs the Hollywood film industry. It was, it was sort of delightful and again, eye opening and fun. Yeah. And this was pre-Netflix, so you know you couldn't really stream into anything without actually being in a theater in the country where you watch the movie. Yes, and I had already gone to several Bollywood movies while I was there, and you know the language barrier doesn't really matter. You can kind of understand what's going on, and I just I loved them. I loved them so much. I remember like sitting in a rooftop in some cafe with you, uh, you know, just uh, taking in the ocean breeze, and we used to invent stories about books that you would write. <laughs> <laughs> well, that 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 tracks. I always have way too many ideas and I have time or ability to finish. So you should write one of them for me, except that you've written your own marvelous book. So I, Yeah, I kick and I fly. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the story of my life. So it's um, it's fun to have a title like that. I mean, I, I, I loved reading this book from you because we also were talking. We, it was a lot of talk about Opniop, which I think had just begun when you were there. And I remember you took me one time to um, some of the brothels in in Mumbai, and I met some of the people that you were working with. So to see all of that and your years of activism come to fruition in a novel, I think is wonderful. One of my favorite sayings is that fiction is the lie that tells the truth and how sometimes it can be more effective to tell the story that you want to tell via fiction as opposed to sort of quote unquote fact. Yeah, it's wonderful to actually remember that journey with you because I was literally starting to work in the brothels and those girls you met at that time are now animation artists and Domino's pizza managers, parlor managers, and have some have graduated and got jobs in uh, multinational corporations. Uh, so they have moved on. They've helped their mothers get out of the brothels by renting places outside. And that red light area itself has shrunk into almost nothing. So there has been such a change and, you know, thousands of girls I've helped all over India from Bombay to Calcutta to Bihar. And, you know, I Kick and I Fly is based in Bihar. But also your own trajectory, because you were working on your first book. And now you have more than six books, I think, uh, which are out in the public. And uh, you have a following among young adults who adore your books, follow them. One of them has been made into a movie, the book you just read from. And how does that feel? What impact has it made? You know, I was just thinking about what you were saying about all of these lives that you have changed, like these young women and their mothers and their own daughters, right, who they had maybe haven't had yet. But you have had this massive impact on people's lives and just how gratifying that is. And I think one of the amazing things about writing a book is that you, when I wrote If I Stay, I wrote it like on the, at the desk shoved in the corner of my family's living room. And it was such a personal story and such a personal project. And then to have it kind of go out into the world and to hear from people of all different ages who connect on an emotional level. I think the one most wonderful thing about books and why I think it's so important for children to read is that they are empathy delivery devices. They put you into an experience of somebody different from you, but they also reflect your own experience. And a lot of times you see yourself in somebody kind of internally who externally seems nothing like you. And I think that can really help to kind of break down barriers. So 
you and I met back when I was a journalist at 17 and right. I was doing social justice issues reporting for 17. And back in those days, people were shocked. Like you're writing about child soldiers or, 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 you know, um, child sex workers for, for a teen magazine, do teenagers care? And 100% they cared. They cared because they have this sort of sense of righteousness and right and wrong. And I think that they really responded to that. So to carry that over into kind of fiction writing um, and really kind of try and get young people to empathize with people who they have a lot more in common with than they, they might otherwise think. It, it's sort of it's the through line between sort of my work as it started and where it is now. What are the main issues that you have touched upon in your books? I think all of my books, even, you know, whether we're talking about If I Stay, where it's this young woman who sort of is in this coma having to decide whether she lives or dies, or just one day, or it's a very um, controlled young woman who finds herself while she's traveling, or I have lost my way, these trio of young people who are so different and bump into each other on the sort of worst day of their lives and, and help each other, or Frankie and Bug, which is a middle grade novel set in the 80s, and it's sort of about allyship. I think in all books, I like to basically confront these characters with situations they don't think that they can handle. And I like to give them the opportunity to rise to the occasion of their lives, because I think that is something that we all need. I think in, in whatever context or way that it is, like we want to be part of something bigger than ourselves and better than ourselves. And, and better by better, I mean like communal part of a community. And to bring these characters to that, I think is is important because I think that's something that is really lacking in American civic life these days. It's become very focused on like the individual and the family. And I don't actually think that that works for people. I don't think it makes people feel good to be so sort of self-centric and, and inward looking. So in my books, I'm constantly showing how creating connections and found family and doing something sort of beyond yourself is actually makes you feel better. So ultimately, there, it's, it's a selfish motivation because you're going to feel better if you're doing this. Absolutely. And most people don't even know it because they have been so isolated and, as you said, so individualized and just put in front of a TV screen growing up mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, now with little iPads, etc., that they're becoming more and more isolated and during COVID, when schools closed down, they didn't even have that much social interaction. And we know how much anxiety and mental health issues have come out of that. Uh, but uh, Gail, you've always done the opposite. And I've known you from the time when you came to cover a story and I was in UNICEF and we talked about that story. But, um, you know, where does that impulse for empathy come from? As you said, like many people know that they want connections, but they don't even know that they want connections. How did you know that you were young yourself and you've made it your whole life's business to build empathy and talk about that empathy or connections? That's a really interesting question. And I don't know exactly. I mean, I know that I was always a, a quote, sensitive child. Like I felt things deeply. I felt, you know, the, you know, if I would see famine on TV, I would want to, I went to my school and try to raise money for it. But so I think that was part of it. But I think that traveling young really changed me from the person I was on my way to becoming to the person I did become. So I was an exchange student when I was in high school. And then instead of going to college, I went traveling for a few years. And that just became, that led to me to want to do journalism and more traveling and I think there's something about constantly pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone and constantly connecting with people who would be so easy to otherize or exoticize until you sit down and have tea with them. And you understand that so many of the things that consume you are the same. And I think that's really helpful now when our country here is so polarized and people are like, oh, I won't talk to anybody who votes that way. And at the end of the day, like, I really like being able to sit down with people and move past that to get to the shared humanity. And I think polarizing people the way that it has has been very expedient for various political groups who do that by intention to separate us. And I want to do anything I can to kind of break down those barriers because 
they are incredibly unhealthy and easy to exploit. And does that begin from like when you have tea with someone, sit down for a cup of tea with someone, does it help by sharing your own vulnerability so that they can also feel safe in sharing their vulnerability and then moving from there? Or what, what is that moment when that happens? I think that's key is sharing your own vulnerability, right? I think particularly in this time when we all see each other sort of curated through our Instagram posts or what have you, it can be so easy to assume like that person is like this and they're having that same assumption about you. So I do think there's something incredibly generous about opening yourself up and being vulnerable to other people. And I remember sort of once when I was doing some political canvassing, and they had sent me to a bunch of houses that did not support the party I was canvassing for. And so I, I sat down and I started talking about healthcare and the things that I'd plagued me and how I was worried about if pre-existing conditions became like a thing that I wouldn't be able to get healthcare. And suddenly everybody was opening up, sharing their own stories, because this is something everybody has a, a problem with their health. Our human bodies just break down sometime. And it was just amazing how that little shred of sort of shared humanity allowed us to kind of have a conversation whether or not they changed their vote or not. I don't know, but we had a, a common talk and we, we came together as humans. And I think that is unfortunately like increasingly lacking. And that's the only way forward, which COVID has taught us that you can't really stop a virus with a wall. The virus is going to get into our bodies, come what may, and we are interconnected and interdependent. So if one group of humans get vaccines and another group does not, then the virus will still exist on our planet and, you know, we'll, we'll get it eventually. So, um, you know, how I, I know that in many of your books, uh, there's a vulnerability that your characters overcome and move forward. And for a long time, they don't even know they have it, but they're grappling with it in any case. Uh, how do you find uh, these issues like are, are you sitting in a cafe listening to somebody talk is it from a friend where do you pick up your story ideas from they're all about me you know they're all about sort of the vulnerabilities or the the issues that I'm going through and sometimes I don't even realize it at the time until after I've written it so one of my books is called I was here and that one was actually um, the idea came to me from an article I'd written years before about young people who ended their own lives. And um, one of the young women's story had really stuck with me because she had um, been encouraged to take her own life by these online suicide, quote unquote, support groups. So I wrote that story, which you could say was in inspired by something that a real life story in a real life young woman named Susie Gonzalez. But when I finished it, because it's not about the, the young woman who takes her own life, but her best friend, I realized this is a book about what happens when you give all your power away and what it feels like to kind of take it back. So every time I write a book, it, it, it's something like that. My most recent young adult novel is We Are Inevitable. And that one is set present day, post pandemic at a failing bookstore in Washington state. And it's mostly a bunch of like white men whose lives have not gone the way they wanted it to go. And I want it, sometimes you write the world as it is, and sometimes you write the world as you want it to be. And I wanted to write this like humorous, warm-hearted story about these people who, instead of turning inward on and curdling in bitterness and resentment for the fact that their lives had sort of been interrupted, they come together and they find a new, new way forward and they build that community. And it, it's so joyful. And I think that I was craving that kind of joy and laughter and community in my life. And it was a book that I was finishing up under lockdown. So it, it felt even more poignant, but it's always something that I'm dealing with or it's an issue that I want to explore. And when did you have the self-confidence inside yourself to know what issue you want to explore? Like, when did you know you even have a free voice or had the freedom to explore and then have the self-confidence to write about it for anonymous people out there? You know, I think part of it is born of my privilege. I'm a middle class white person. So I, you know, I came up, you know, not thinking there were barriers to that. I mean, it was interesting. I didn't ever, I didn't know any writers. I didn't know any working artists growing up. So it's not like I was like, oh, I want to be like that. Today, young people have 
so much more access to talk to writers that they care about. But as I was growing up, my parents, you know, my dad used to call me the can-do kid, and they would say things like, you can do anything you want to do. So it didn't occur to me to ever write a novel. And then when it did, it didn't occur to me that I couldn't write a novel. So I think part of that is, you know, just just the privilege that I sort of was grown up with and the, the lack of barriers that faced me once I tried to get, get into this world. Then what happens, though, once you start to become successful at it, that's when you have to sort of shut up the voices that say you're not good enough. You, you know, that was your one shot. Like, you, you can't, you, you're not very good at this. You should just quit. Your writing is terrible. And that, I think, is just, you know, part of the life of an artist is, is grappling with that and using some of that to motivate you to always be better and learning to shut the majority of it up. And I know you wrote that in the introduction, I think, for I Have Lost My Way, that at the time you wrote it, you felt you'd lost your way. Yes. What was that like, that um, few months or few weeks? Uh, few you know? few years, I would say. Um, I, I During a period of about two years, I think I started and, and almost finished about seven different books. And each time I was like, this book is terrible. This book is terrible. I'm bad at this. I, And I just felt that this thing that I had always done, because I have been making up stories since before I can write. I have been writing down stories long before I ever conceived of a career as it. And so it is this thing that I've always done that had brought me comfort and entertainment and helped me make sense of the world. Suddenly I couldn't do it anymore. So it was terrifying. It was like this vortex of just anxiety. And I think that's in retrospect what it was. I was suffering from depression and anxiety at the time. But I just kept thinking, I've lost my way. It kept going through my head. And then one day, it was this other young woman saying this. And it was a, a, I knew she was a singer who had lost her voice. And so I sat down and I wrote the words, I've lost my way. It was the opening line of the book and went from there. Hmm. Interesting. And was it something to do with uh, an illness you had or was it what was the trigger? Like, was there something outside which had happened, which you couldn't really find a solution to? How how do, how does someone reach there and how does someone get out of it? Like, you know, I want my listeners to understand that you did get out of that feeling of despair and anxiety by doing something. But, you know, does it happen accidentally? Is it what happens? What are the triggers for both? It's, it's super complicated. So I think that that had to do with where we were in the world. It was post-2016. So, you know, in addition to like the sort of political cataclysm, there was also, you know, I was coming off of like, if I stay being a film and, you know, the height of my popularity and success and then having a couple books that didn't do so well. So anxiety around that. Also, Interesting to find out that as women approach middle age and our hormones drop off, any issue that you have with, like with anxiety or depression can get much, much worse. So I didn't realize all of that was happening. So the act of writing helped me. But I will say, and I, there were some health issues that happened afterwards. I had um, like a very luckily very early breast cancer. Um, but all of that, you know, really kind of messed with my head. And I remember it was New Year's Eve 2019, about to go into 2020. And I, I went to my doctor's office. I'm just like, I'm going to get in here, spend so much money on healthcare. I'm going to get in here with one more appointment before my deductible restarts. And I started crying. And I said, I think I need medicine. And I started taking Lexapro and it was life-changing for me. And three months later was the pandemic. And I think by being able to biochemically correct what has always been a very elevated level, I would say, of sort of stress hormone in my body, it has allowed me to kind of like weather so much of what is going on. So, you know, I know that there's still as far as we come with with mental mental health, I still think there's such a stigma around it. It's like, OK, I take a statin for my high cholesterol and I take an SSRI for my high anxiety. And it completely freed me up because it really helped to kind of shut down the voices and helped me to also um kind of recognize the situation that I'm in. It's like, oh, I feel jealous and bad right now. Okay. And let it go over and not just kind of spin down. So those combinations of things, writing has always been my therapy. And again, being vulnerable with people because I stop, I don't hide this anymore. I will talk about it at the drop of a hat. I think it's important. And nine times out of 10, when I tell somebody something like this, they return with a story of their own. 
And it's the kind of thing that we don't share, which is crazy because we are all going through this. And I was just responding to some reader emails yesterday about I've lost my way. And one character said, I, I, I loved this book because it made me feel like I was less alone. Mm. And I think that is what fiction can do. It can make you feel like you are less alone in this world. Absolutely. And then in We Are Inevitable, you know, you have this warm hearted sense of community and people who come together can bring about the change that they want. So you did overcome not just losing your way and finding your way again, but you also find hope at the end. Uh, you know, I can see the trajectory in your books again and again. And, yes. And, uh, yeah. you know, I think that's what makes you also a peace and democracy activist. And I would like you to talk about that. Um, I'm glad you asked. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that happens in my books and I think is reflected in my life is things go down in a way you don't want them to go down. And you could just hunker down in misery about it. And maybe you need a day or two to do that. And then it's like, okay, dust myself off. What can I do to make things better? And that has been sort of something that I've sort of tried to do in my personal life and in my, in my work. And particularly in the last few years, seeing what's happening in our country, it really brought me to a place I didn't expect, which was to do a lot of work focused on state legislatures in our country, which I'm going to give a little civics lesson because I didn't know this. So after the 2016 election, um, you know, me and some other sort of children's book authors were trying to figure out what what happened and what can we do differently. And and strangely, it came down to really understanding the the structures and levers in our country that control power. And back in 2016, we realized how much impact state legislatures are, which is like the state house and state senate in you know each individual state, which not only make most of the laws that sort of dictate what your life is about but also voting restrictions, gerrymandering, voter suppression. So I started organizing in, um, around that. And um, Daniel Squadron, who was a state senator here, he, we worked with him and he eventually left his seat to start this organization called the States Project, which is sort of aimed at putting together grassroots groups to help fund um, State, legis sort of state legislative races. And it sounds very boring. It's like the most unsexy branch of state government. But I feel like in the last couple of years, we have really seen whether we're looking at like COVID response state by state or whether states have taken the Medicaid expansion money from the ACA or not to right now, state legislatures perhaps being places that will eventually overthrow a democratically decided election and of course, with the matter of reproductive rights, like that now depends on who is in your state legislature. Absolutely. And also, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, I teach um, also, so I meet young people all the time, uh, you know, through my activism or through my teaching. And, you know, sometimes young people are quite cynical and they'll tell me, why should we save democracy? Why democracy is just a hypocrisy. And people have bartered away our rights just to make money. So, you know, everybody is the same. And we'd rather choose people who are less hypo hypocritical than people who are, you know, sort of camouflaging what they do in the rhetoric of democracy. So what would you, what are the answers that uh, you would give to someone say, you know, who asked this question, why save democracy? Well, I think we have to repair democracy and we have to make it work as it never has done, right? This is not, this has never been a democracy for all, but voting is such an important mechanism for, it's not the end all, but if you have an engaged electorate that votes and, and, and votes and then forces their, their elected officials to do the things that they say because they work for us, that's how change happens. Like that's how we've seen things, wonderful things like marriage equality before it was federal. It, it passed in like Iowa and California and Massachusetts, state by state by state. And then it became federal. We saw that with um, the ACA. It was, there was Hawaii care and Obamacare, I mean, and Romney care, and then it became Obamacare. So actually really substantive things happen in these very unglamorous and often very shrouded parts of the government. And that is by intent. Because the less ordinary people are paying attention, the more that spe special interests can get in 
and can manipulate and do what they want. And that's exactly what's happened. So I understand why young people would think that way. I would say that maybe they should be voting. For, they should be running for office themselves in some of these areas. They should be paying attention to this. They should be paying attention to all of the structures of democracy. I think we spend a lot of time thinking about president or Senate or sometimes with these like big emotional races. But at the end of the day, it is like this boring nitty gritty of what is happening in your state capital that is going to determine whether like California that just outlawed um, gasoline cars as of 2035. And auto manufacturers are going to have to really step up making electric cars because of what California did. And that is what happened in the California legislature. So you have the ability to put people in office, because I know a lot of young people are like, what the hell is going on with these people in office? The planet is dying and they are acting with no urgency. You have the ability to change that. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, to understand that if you don't, as you said, special interest groups will take over because there's never a vacuum in anything. And those groups will even make you fight for the right to control your own body. Yeah. Or your right to vote. Even your right to vote. Yeah. Like, yes, absolutely. And uh, so, uh, you know, now we have a whole two or three years coming up where people will have the ability to exercise their vote again and again and choices to make. And I've noticed that, uh, you know, exactly what you're talking about, that young people have to come out and speak and get into politics and maybe fight elections themselves and all of that. I've seen younger and younger activists come up in America, which is a phenomena I find fascinating. Uh, you know, recently there was a 12-year-old girl uh, who went viral. Her name is Naraya, and she was talking about bodily autonomy and what uh, people are doing in her state legislature. She showed up and testified. You know, there are climate change activists and there are uh, people who are fighting against gun violence and so many other issues. Um, and you have been traveling the length and breadth of the country for your books. So you have been meeting young people uh, because young adults is the medium you've chosen, children's books and young adults as your uh, form of expression. So what are the issues that uh, young people raise with you when you talk to them? I think lately... There's a lot of worry about mental health, rightly so. I mean, you you touched on it before, and I this this came home personally in my family. The pandemic was really really rough. I also think that the what we that phenomenon we talked about was sort of social media and seeing all these perfect lives and comparing your own to them unfavorably. It really kind of adds to that. And there's so much wonderful things that come out of social media. We have wonderful activist movements. Black Lives Matter never would have happened. There's amazing things that are happening on TikTok, but I also think it increases anxiety and it's incredibly anxious time to be living. Again, the, the planet is heading toward disaster. Gun violence continues unabated in this country. I understand why young people are like, what is wrong with the grownups? Why aren't they doing anything? So I, I hear about that. I I hear a lot of young people really questioning capitalism, and I appreciate this greatly. And you know, I'm not a I'm not a communist or a socialist, but I think there needs to be checks and controls on it because capitalism running unabated will mean that the gun manufacturers get to decide gun laws, and we will we will somehow tolerate elementary school students being gunned down, and it means that we will continue to send our planet toward the precipice because fossil fuel companies don't want to switch over to renewable. So I understand that. And I, I think it's really impressive that 15, 16 year olds are kind of understanding the economic forces that are underpinning so many of the political forces, because at the end of the day, it really is all about the money. Yeah. And at the end of the day, all these monopolies are actually taking away our choices. Yes. Because they're becoming bigger and bigger just because they're not regulated. Yep. And, uh, you know, if you have to shop, you have to shop in a certain way. If you have to uh, work, you have to work in a certain way. If you have to go to college, you have to fulfill a whole checklist of things uh, which you can't really afford. Right. If you want to avoid this, if you want to not participate in the monopoly, you don't want to. So you're not Googling. You're not using like Google Maps and all of those things. You're not ordering from Amazon. But there's that saying that if you're not paying anything for the product, you are the product, right? And uh, and again, here's where we are. Like, I think all these comp companies are great, but there needs to be regulation. 
right? There, there needs to be, they have gotten so big and the tech companies have sort of eaten up everything. And, you know, arguably, I mean, I don't want to like call out meta, but I guess I'll call out meta, like these like occasional things like where Instagram is giving best practices and they don't know that they're having a deleterious effect on young people. That's, they absolutely know. They 100% know. Absolutely. They don't care. They yeah, don't care. Yeah. I, I, you know, they, uh, someone brought out a survey about uh, the impact on mental health on young girls through Instagram, you know, because of this perfect life and the pressure to look a certain way, behave a certain way. And, you know, you can't really do that in real life. No. It's like Barbie doll life. Yeah. And it's impossible. And also, like, the way that we treat each other and the public discourse that we have now, it's a lot harder to be that horrible to somebody to their face. You see their face fall. You have a empathetic response where online, just the, the sort of viciousness that people can hurl back and forth and this is on all sides and just, oof, it's... Uh, it's a lot. I have to face it all the time because of my work against yeah. the sex industry. How do you how do you handle that? Like, how do you create a bubble so that you don't internalize that? Sometimes I get very, very despairing, you know, and it just drains me if I see it in the morning, especially when the day is about to start. So I'll see something pink and I'll click on it and it's like a flashing uh, body part, a male body part or something. And then, you know, or a or my breasts or something, you know, someone's amorphed my body with some strange breasts or whatever. So it feels very degrading. And I didn't... By intention. Absolutely yeah. by intention. By somebody I don't know or anything, you know. So I scrub it. Sometimes I think I'll hire someone to keep scrubbing for me. Then I think it's a waste of money. So I go back and forth. Uh, but I've learned to tune it out. Like tune. literally I've learned to tune it out and... Also, now social media is not something I spend too much time on anymore. Like I'll do half an hour in the morning, maybe half an hour in the evening and let it go. Because, you know, if I'm going on, I've, you know, muted all the notifications on my phone and etc. So I don't get distracted and just started doing things which are much more physical. So if I can paint, then I will paint, you know, I won't do anything on the iPad. I'll use real paints, a real drawing book. Uh, right. You've become an amazing artist. I, I, painting, you took painting up during the pandemic or before? During the lockdown, because, yeah. you know, it was so soothing. And I was like devastated by changes in election, uh, you know, what happened in the elections. Then I saw in India, massive hunger people dying uh, because they lost their livelihoods overnight and many people are daily wage earners and they were migrating home and dying on the way and you know it was horrible the misery that I saw and uh, then I was in my parents home um, in like in the middle of an orchard childhood home which had been neglected for a long time because all the children had left my parents began to live in the city and here we were in the small Himalayan town and it was monsoon and I saw that life begins again and it was absolutely lush and abundant green as only a tropical monsoon does to nature and I realized that what dies is regenerated and born again and that gave me hope and uh, you know even our old abandoned neglected house came to life because all of us children were there with the parents mm -hmm. which couldn't have happened had COVID not happened right so the good and the bad the unbearable and the profound happened to me together and I decided I'm going to paint because I stumbled across an old childhood uh, drawing book from 40 years ago, wow. unfinished and six poster paints, you know, little bottles of paint jars and two broken brushes. And there was nothing to do. So I said, I'll paint the beauty of this garden, which my mother has planted for 50 years. I know every tree and every plant. Why not paint that? And just that physicality of it. And that I had to notice what I was painting made me feel so interconnected with the world. And I realized there's really no hierarchy between a frog and a bird or a mango tree in nature. And only if I can share that with other people. That's, a, that's wonderful. And, and I think that this idea of like that the world will go on without us, um, it's oddly comforting. It, it requires us to kind of decenter us as, as our own particular lives and as, as humanity itself. But like sometimes I think, well, the world will continue. Yes. And, you know, I also have realized that, you know, uh, the neurosis, which is fed to us constantly through social media is something we have to not allow. Because, you know, neurosis is what makes us feel insecure and insecure makes us feel angry. And then the anger can turn into hurting other people, either at a very micro level between you and me, 
or inside the family or the community, but also at a very macro level in the political decisions we make, who we vote for, etc. So, you know, if we don't feel insecure, we are more likely to have that cup of tea with someone who we don't think is like us and come to a unanimous agreement about what do we want for healthcare. But if I think resources are disappearing and I may not even get that cup of tea later, then I don't want to have the cup of tea with you. I'll quietly, secretly have the tea by myself so that I don't have to share because who knows what the future holds, right? I mean, the scarcity mindset that you talk about is huge. And I think partially true. I mean, we're going to see that increasingly with with climate change, and I think it'll hit the global south far more or, or far sooner than it will hit other places. You know, I was just reading this morning about the drought in China over the summer and, and how that has sort of devastated crops and, and sort of China's breadbasket. So partially it is there, but then I also think about how one third of the world's food supply goes to waste each year. So there surely is enough, but the scarcity mindset really makes you want to hunker down. And that that sort of harkens back to earlier in the conversation, we were talking about the you focus on the need of the individual. It's like, well, I have to close ranks here because there's not enough. And it's interesting with social media because I'm always trying to kind of find the the balance between letting enough in so that I'm aware of what's going on in the world and I can do and react in places that I can. And in some cases, that's how I vote. And in some cases, that's how I donate money. And in some cases, it's the issues that I try and share versus letting so much in because there's been studies about that. Like the human mind is not built to take that influx of kind of bad news. And I know like when there's a catastrophe, people will just be addicted to being online and it paralyzes. So I need to be aware enough of what's going on to be galvanized to constantly be thinking of ways that I can use my platform, my privilege, my abilities to try and make the world better, but not so much so that it makes me want to go hide in a corner, hunker down and not share tea with anyone because I think we're running out of water. Exactly. And you know, that's exactly like, you know, when I was painting also, I realized that there's a garden still on earth. And, uh, you know, we do why should we dismantle what is beautiful here for something which is like in the future? You know, people are saying, oh, we'll give you a beautiful garden in the future. We'll give you a beautiful garden in outer space. You know, I've heard people say that I'll create a better world in Mars or wherever. But, you know, why should we chase something which we don't even know will be when we already have something good and destroy that for that something which will never be? That, I have no idea. Like that, that just makes no sense. And maybe that's just, it's easier to think about, oh, we'll be able to make a new world on Mars, which like, hi, we don't have the technology to do that. And do you really want to do that? And destroy the present garden for something. which Exactly. Is- versus like really deal with the fact that we're going to have to make some sacrifices and some changes to, in order to keep the present garden intact and feeding all of us. And that, you know, you said something about like, you know, there is enough food, but, you know, it gets wasted. So Gandhi once had a saying uh, in which he said that there's enough in this world for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. So if we can somehow create a check and balance between need and greed so that people have incentive to do things, but they also learn how to share and, uh, you know, come to that uh, maybe you know, we can convey those messages through our st- storytelling. I think so. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, one of my favorite TV shows that I've been watching is Succession. And I think it's such a it's such an interesting sort of peephole into that degree of wealth and how corrosive it is and how miserable these people are, but just how the accumulation of more and more and more and at the expense of so much so, um, you know, it is true. And I think that going back to studies, aren't there studies that like there's a certain amount of money that makes people happier and then you hit a saturation point and then it actually starts to go down. Like you need enough to know that your your needs are taken care of. It'd be great to live in a country where you didn't have to worry about college or healthcare bankrupting. You know, it, we've seen that in other countries it doesn't have to be this way. So I think that if people were not always operating from this sort of fear scarcity, which I think is built into the system in the United States because, you know, that, that sort of safety, safety net for the middle class or the working class is kind of disappearing. So it's sort of, you know, kill or be killed here. 
Um, mm. I think if that were removed, I think it would be a lot more, a lot easier for people to kind of relax and and not worry about, well, I, I don't think that that, you know, I don't want my money, my tax dollars going to that sort of that immigrant family there. It's like, well, if you have enough, then maybe you won't be so worried about somebody else, quote unquote, taking what's yours. But there's a reason we don't have enough in this country, and it's not the immigrant family. It's, it's you know, other other factors that are really just, you know, back to Amazon and not paying any taxes. <laughs> I know. And you, you in your book also did a real shout out to independent sellers, you know, and indie bookstores, I remember. How was that, uh, you know, what, uh, what happened? Did you go to all these indie bookstores? And uh, what is the ecosystem of an indie bookstore? You will soon find this out. Indie bookstores are, you know, the, the book, we should talk about We Are Inevitable. And, and it, it opens with him talking about how there's been like this big, you know, there was a the meteorite that came and destroyed everything. And one of those meteorites for an independent bookstore in Washington State would obviously be the unspoken one of Amazon. And we saw how Amazon really initially, it, it, a lot of the independent bookstores kind of didn't survive, but the ones that did really evolved and adapted and they became not just bookstores, but they're like centers of community. And interestingly, during the pandemic, I really felt how much I missed going into any bookstores acutely. And one of the highlights would be like ordering a book that I would go to my tiny little neighborhood bookstore, shout out to Terrace Bookstore in Windsor Terrace, and pick it up through the little window. And that just felt like this moment of kind of connection. And it was so gratifying for me to hear that a lot of the independent bookstores, their communities really came, showed up for them during the pandemic. People bought tons of books. People bought gift certificates that they never spent. Strand Bookstore here in New York had this thing where they were in trouble. And like two days later, there were lines around the corner. So it was really wonderful to see these bookstores telling their communities were in trouble and the communities recognizing what a resource these bookstores are just beyond being a store that sells books and making sure that they, they, they could survive this. So that was really gratifying. And, you know, I wanted, we are inevitable to, there was a, we did a bunch to kind of support the independent bookstores and donate to Bink, which is the bookseller charity that supports the independent bookstores um, but it was wonderful to hear that a lot of them, that was already happening. Their, their, their people came out for them. And I think that that goes to show that we crave these places of connection. We crave that community that being part of a book reading culture creates. And we want to have these spaces both virtual and actual. Absolutely. And, you know, the thing is that I grew up in India at a time pre-globalization, uh, you know, I was at the cusp. So I actually used to go to a tailor to get my clothes stitched. So I knew the tailor and his family very well because I knew him all through my growing up period. And now the tailor doesn't exist and we go to retail stores to buy medium, large, whatever. You know, it's all just standardized and I never meet a human being. I don't have any connection with the salesperson. Uh, you know, it's all she's always changing or he's always changing there. So everything has become so uninteractive. And so um, there's no connection. Like in New York, I do still have cafes where I know the people working or taxi drivers who I'll chat with all the time. But slowly, you know, the idea of independence is going and that also will create its own mental health crisis. Because if we don't have human contact, if we're only talking to machines all the time, we are going to feel more and more isolated. Right. And sometimes even... You feel that things are automated even when there's people working there just because they're so interchangeable. So I, I agree. I think those, again, we keep report, uh, re referring to studies, but there was a study yesterday that I share with my whole family because it's just about how little interactions, like little positive interactions are huge. So I just think, and one of the things I love about New York City, which I think surprises people who don't live here, is how often they happen. Really? How often you just will talk to the person in the taxi or the random person next to you in line. And and it opens up these worlds. It opens up these connections. So all of that is just, it's kind of magical about it. And to me, something like that, holding open a door for something, simple as that, and getting like a look in the eye and a thank you, or having the door held open for me, that gives me a little, it's like this little 
flare of joy and you get enough of those and they buoy you. It's, it's incredible. And one of the things about the city as maddening as it is, is how many opportunities there are for connections like that. That's absolutely true. You know, it just makes you feel, as you said, the little flare of joy because you've had like an unexpected human uh, connection, interaction, and it can be humorous. And because it's such an egalitarian city, so anybody can tell anybody anything. So I remember once I was in a taxi and there was a taxi driver playing some music and I liked it. And I said, well, I like the music. And he said, oh, and uh, where do you think I'm from? You know, somehow one thing led to another. So it was some Russian composer. So I said, Russian. So he said, no. So he said, guess again. And I don't know why I said Egypt. And he said, you're right. And then he proposed to me. He said, you know, <laughs> I have met my previous wives in this taxi. And will you marry me? So I said, I'm sorry, I'm married already. He said, I like Indian girls. And I said, how did you know I'm Indian? And he said, oh, you know, Indian girls... Uh, just walk with more independence than other girls. I said, oh, how interesting. And he said, you always wear loose clo cotton clothes, Indian girls. I said, interesting. This Egyptian taxi driver notices how Indian girls look and behave in a city in New York and had the gumption to just ask me to marry him. Maybe it was a joke. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was a date uh, invitation. I don't know. But it can only happen in New York at so many levels. It's true. I, again, I was answering reader questions yesterday and somebody asked me why I said I have lost my way in New York City. And it's a story about this internet famous pop star, this closeted first generation Pakistani teen, and this um, young man uh, from kind of a very troubled background from Washington State. And they literally bump into each other, like somebody falls on top of somebody else and concusses him. In Central Park. In Central Park. And I said, it's because I can't think of another place in the world where these three people would be in the same place and meet like that. Yeah. And it's not just the identity of, you know, race and ethnicity. It's also of class. Like, you know, everything is sort of blurred in moments here. And that's how people are right now at this moment in history in New York, you know, and it may change. But for now, this is New York. I mean, I think it is changing. I think it is becoming, you know, like, but one of the wonderful things about New York City is the subway, right? Pretty much everybody takes the subway. Every it is, It is just this great big, it mixes everybody together. And I think like, you know, it's, it's harder to be fearful and otherize people when you're walking, you know, around them. And we're just talking about this. I remember when my youngest daughter was about seven and I was walking her to the bus stop one day and she had her like two little hair and two poofs and she was wearing like maybe a Dora the Explorer backpack and we were what there's a big Yemeni population near where we live and so there was like a woman in a full burqa walking her daughter to school who had her hair and two little puffs and a Dora the Explorer backpack and again you look as a western woman at a woman in a, in a burqa and you can have all kinds of feelings about that and I just think like seeing the two girls it's just like we are two mothers walking our two daughters to the bus stop in the morning. And there's just something about that that to me is so much of why I love the city. I think it's also just, it's like you get to travel and have those experiences without ever having to leave. And you get to sort of see the shared humanity of so many different kinds of people without ever having to leave home. Absolutely. And how can we hold on to that and how can we you know, share it with others and get more and more people to be able to coexist like this with a feeling of not just safety, but it's beyond safety. It's a feeling of freedom. Yeah, joy, expansion. Yes. It's hard because as we discussed earlier, there are a lot of very intentional forces that that want people to um, tribalize. It, it's it's very effective for for all kinds of people to to sort of have us be sort of angry at each other, or fearful of each other. So books are a really great and kind of low stakes way for undoing that. And and you can see how threatening that is by how many books are being banned right now, because those same forces that are looking to keep us divided, one hundred percent. Do not want a book that is going to humanize a trans kid or talk about, you know, what it's like to be like young and black in a city. They don't want that. And it's, you know, they'll have all the reasoning that they about it, but it's it's really just like 
that's how dangerous books are as empathy delivery devices, that the forces in this world that want you to kind of stay on your side don't want you to have any any um, access to them. So Gail, uh, you know, books are a medium. And of course, you have chosen young adults as your medium and children's books. Why have you chosen young adults and children's books and not adult books? I mean, I have written some adult books, but I, this is where my heart is. And I, I don't know, but I mean, I know that I, I mean, I do know, but I started my career wanting to work for a teen magazine. And I just think there's an openness to young people. So you really have like an opportunity and a responsibility to kind of um, get them at this time. I think anybody who's worked with young people understands how frequently we underestimate them. So it's wonderful to treat them with respect and, and, and meet them at a higher level and see them meet you and surpass you at that level. I also think that young people are given license to feel their feelings as they truly are, whereas you get older, you're expected to kind of moderate and bottle. And I think there's this misconception that your feelings blunt as you get older. And to some degree, that's probably true, like with lack of hormones and all of that. But it really isn't. People feel things just as deeply. It's just we're told not to. So I think there's something just about the kind of honesty and immediacy that you can write um, for young people. And then, you know, nobody responds like a young reader either. They're just, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to be out on tour, to be in schools and to have these conversations. And now having two teenagers of my own and seeing as the culture is shifting so quickly to listen and learn from young people because what they are doing and what they are challenging and some of the ideas that I have long held, you know, my own daughters have, have forced me to, to reevaluate. And that's, that's pretty, it's pretty incredible. So they have a lot to teach us. It's, it's a great readership to write for. What does the future of freedom look like to you? I mean, on one level, it is, it is sort of freedom to, to live in a habitable environment. So I think that that is sort of huge and to, large degree, unfortunately, like not in our individual control, it's in our collective control to get the institutions that need to do something about that. But when I look at young people today, like I look at what's happening with sort of how they see gender and sexuality and how there are these constructed norms that we have lived with. And the assumption is like, everybody's done it this way and this is the way it has to be. And young people saying, wait, why? And what does it hurt you if I define myself differently. So I think that, you know, in some ways, the way I'm seeing my kids' generation sort of divorce, you know, biological sex from perform gender is, is huge. And it's also telling in that, like, we, we, we will choose to identify how we want to identify. I hope that all of this incredible sort of throwing off of strictures will eventually also apply to some of the structures that we have institutionally. So I think we've seen it, the way it's changed workplaces and what have you in schools. And I think we need to see it happening, bringing it back electorally to the kind of people who represent us. I think a lot of young people are like, why are these 90-year-olds who've been in office for decades representing us? And I 100% agree with that. And guess who has the power to change that? They do. We all do. So, so I'm hoping. Yep. have to get out of the vote. They have to get out of the vote. They have to run for office. They have to realize that like activism on the streets, activism is important. Then finding the people to elect is important. And then continuing that activism to ensure that those people you elected are doing what you want them to do because you have the power to hire them and fire them. And this is Gail Foreman on A Free Voice who says that the future of freedom hinges on us going out and taking control, go vote, and then control the institutions and make the institutions do what we are doing with our bodies right now. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Ashira. It was a pleasure to be here. I'm Ruchira Gupta, and thank you for listening to A Free Voice. Subscribe to our podcast to get notifications of new episodes or check us out at ruchiragupta.com. 
The podcast is produced by Ram Devineni with Ratapalix and Bowery Poetry. Special thanks to Leela Kapoor and Anika Kothari. This podcast series is funded by the Citizen Diplomacy Action Fund, which is sponsored by the US Department of State and implemented by Global Ties US in partnership with the Office of Alumni Affairs in the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. Additional support from New York State Council on the Arts, Governor of New York State and the New York State Legislature.